Welcome to a new EEA uh, Facebook Live Ask an Expert. Today is the World International Biological Diversity Day or World Biodiversity Day. And of course, we are going to talk about nature, biodiversity, natural capital, habitats, ecosystems, you name it. My name is Gulchen Kaya Dennis from the EEA Communication Department, and I'm joined here by two colleagues. I'm Brian Makshari from the um, Nature and Conservation Unit in the agency. My name is Jan Erik Peters, and I work in the same program. So, as I mentioned, we are going to talk about natural capital accounting, many economic terminology uh, terms here, but uh, we'll get to that. Maybe we start with something a little bit more simple. What is biodiversity? I can start off with Jan Erik. You can jump in. So, I think the, there are a number of definitions around it, and there's a history as to where names come from, but. It really is very much about life around us and everything that we see, everything that we eat, we breed, and that's what biodiversity is. It's just the variation in life that is in the entire planet, and we're one of the elements of that. Um, and it's you know becoming quite important over the last number of years. A lot of um, information is coming available on it. But so it is yeah. life, but yes. one of the terminologies is ecosystem. So we are getting a little bit more technical. So how do you then differ? What is ecosystem? What is an ecosystem? What are we talking about when we talk about ecosystems? W well, an ecosystem is a unit that comprises many different species. So a forest is an ecosystem, a lake is an ecosystem. You can have uh, an entire sea, which is an ecosystem. Uh, so they are spatial, geographic places where you have uh, species that rely on similar conditions. Okay, so a forest could be an ecosystem, you said a lake, and the whole s all the set of species living in it uh, are part of that. And then we'll get a little bit more technical, yeah. so this is when we talk about capital. For me, you know, we talk about accounting capital. If we are talking about life, and nature, it is priceless, but accounting is such a, there's a monetary connotation. So what is natural capital and what is accounting? Well, for it? the natural capital is really an economic expression for diversity and uh, state of life around us, state of ecosystems. So it, it doesn't aim to say it, it should be uh, something which is only useful to ourselves, but I it aims to bring biodiversity ecosystem science into economic speech and economic theory so we can connect economy, economy and uh, ecosystems uh, to better manage ecosystems. Maybe we'll get to that point a little bit uh, in a little bit uh, when we talk about the report that you've been uh, managing and we published today. So again, it's natural capital accounting, and it is to support policy making uh, in Europe. But um, to kind of put it in a wider context, maybe for our viewers, um, what do we know about biodiversity and uh, nature and ecosystems? I mean, there's lots of facts and figures out there, but there's a few that have always struck me as quite important. So, for example, there are about 75% of the food that we eat comes from 12 crops and 5 animals. 90% um, of the food that is made up in the world comes from 100 crops, and 71 of those are pollinated or created by insects and bees and butterflies and ants and so forth. So, going back to what Jan Eric was saying about kind of getting people to understand the importance of it is that if you remove those from the environment, how much would it cost you to have to fertilize all of these? Um, and another one that gets me is my, one of my passions is chocolate. So for example... Who doesn't love yeah, chocolate? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> well you can do it for coffee as well, but the majority of um, cocoa beans which make chocolate are grown in two countries, Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire in Africa. And they're pollinated and created by different insects. And as Ian Eric said, the conditions that they live in, the forests, the grassland, and so forth. Um, and if they're ch being changed because of climate change and so forth and deforestation, that'll be gone. So without biodiversity, we have no chocolate and no coffee. Well, I, ca I can't imagine a life yeah. without chocolate. But this is a live interaction. So for those of you uh, watching this, please. Uh, Submit your questions in the comment section. So I'll be actually, you know, asking our experts. So no chocolate. 
So this is one of the things. First. Okay. Um, how can we, maybe it links to the work that, you, I, at least I know that it links to the work that you're doing. Um, how do we know what state it is in and how can we measure uh, any kind of decline or what the threats are? What are the w w tools and what are the indications that we can use to improve the situation? Well, this is maybe the occasion to say what accounting aims to do. Really, accounting aims to produce a structured overview of what's happening to nature, what's happening to ecosystem. Uh, and uh, because of this structured approach, it allows us to sum up uh, whether the condition of ecosystem is getting better or worse. Uh, and uh, we know from many different indications that um, biodiversity is declining and that uh, the condition of European ecosystems is actually also deteriorating. Can we uh, say, when you say biodiversity is declining, what are we talking about? So fewer bees, for example. It was two days ago, it was the, uh, the World Bee Day, and that has been hitting the news. Uh, what else? W what do we see? Well, we, we have, at a European level, we, we collect a lot of information from countries, and kind of uniquely in the world, what we across do Europe. across Europe is we have these... Um, there's legislation from the European Union and uh, 28 countries work in collaboration for that. And one thing they do is every six years they report on information on the condition of how the, the species and habitats, the landscapes are. So the, the, the state this that the a particular state, forest yeah. is in, for yeah. example. And there is or a lake. thousands of people who are collecting this information from every country in, in Europe giving us. And what we can do is we, we get this information at a European level and we we analyze it and we use our, our knowledge to get information about it and we then present that in a series of reports for policymakers. Um, and some of the reading may not be particularly nice to see from our perspective. I mean, we, we have lots of facts and figures that, um, you know, 16% of the habitats or the landscapes we know are what we, we say would be good, but over 60% of them are actually quite threatened. Um, and then similar for species as well, we can see that, for example, for wild birds, it's actually a bit more positive. About half of them are what we call good or secure. But and what, what does that mean? So they're not that threatened. Well, it, it, it means that the, their, their trend is increasing. It may not be increasing very quickly, but it's increasing. But it might be that their 10 years ago, their population was so low okay. that they're growing, they're increasing, increasing. But what we try to do over a long period of time is we try to work out what's happening over a 10, 20 year period and by doing that you can really see what's happening. We don't want the one one year, two years are particularly good or bad. We don't want that to bias us. Yeah. We have a first question actually. Um, Shaji Johnson is asking, is a program promoted by the EA to protect and rejuvenate rivers in South Asia including India? Of course you did mention that our uh, work remit uh, does deal with uh, Europe, European countries, but maybe we could actually take this opportunity to, to clarify how maybe we support EU policymakers who do not collect information from... Um yeah, so w we collect information predominantly within Europe, but also from some European overseas countries, as they call it. So we're very much collecting that information. But we do help support the European Union and what they're doing in terms of biodiversity globally. And there's a few programs from the European Union that help fund biodiversity in the Caribbean, in Africa, and in there's one other one uh, in the Pacific regions as well. And there's other projects as well where they work particularly well in these particular countries. We try to share what we do at an agency level in terms of how we collect information, how we analyze it, how we produce it with the world as a whole. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to showcase what we can do and what can be done, and share that with anyone who can help. Yeah. I could add that um, in the ecosystem accounting arena, there's international cooperation. Uh, we help to develop international standards uh, and uh, achieve training of practitioners in different countries. And the European Commission is um, funding programs for ecosystem accounting uh, run by the United Nations in many Part different countries yeah. a, a around the world. So it's a yeah. bit of a knowledge uh, transfer as yes. well when it comes to tools to measure progress, etc. 
One thing that uh, you mentioned actually uh, was the EU funding for you know uh, projects to support biodiversity and uh, protection of nature in the EU. So what is being done? There, there's a program called Life. What does Life do? Yeah. So Life works with and across the environmental world of the spectrum, but it also works a lot with what we call the Natura 2000 network, which are these protected areas, and it was world. It was Natura 2000 Day yesterday. Yeah, and yeah. It's so been a very nature kind of friendly it's a nature uh, week. week. So what Life does, it gives funding for work in particular projects. So for example, um, this year there was one project working in Greece about how to avoid um, collisions between road um, drivers and bears in northern Greece. Another one was working on. How did they do it? Like how. I think they started working with, they tried to work out what the causes were and putting increased signage in there. But the EU gave them funding to work on a big project to save lives of humans and save lives from bears as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it was a lot about collecting data and information. In Belgium, they had a project where they were looking at how to reduce flooding in an area that was threatening people who were living there. Mm -hmm. and it was about restoring what was there. So the, the wetlands acted as a sponge. That's true, like yeah. When these habitats actually yeah. get like wetlands and uh, th they get destroyed, yeah. people uh, living close by do feel the effects. Yeah. Um, you did start uh, talking a little bit about the threats. So um, maybe what are the main threats? Can you talk a little bit about what the main threats are to biodiversity loss or, or you know, the kind of degradation that we see in uh, nature? Well, one factor we need to look as, at is which are the economic activities that manage most of our land. And so is agriculture and forestry that manage about 80% of the land surface. So in Europe. In Europe. And this is uh, then um, a key impact factor on the environment. Uh, we have different types of farming, for example. Some of them are nature friendly, others are a direct pressure on the environment and we notice of course that um, intensive farming uh, is increasing in Europe and worldwide and hence we have more negative impacts on the uh, on ecosystems from farming than we have positive impacts and so we need to work on identifying where do these the biggest impact occur what are the management practices that create these and then we need to develop policy responses um, that allow to uh, take measures to improve farming practices. Yeah, but we need food. So, you know, farming is essential mm -hmm. in the sense that we need to produce. So it's, it sounds like a quite big dilemma. We need farming, we need to produce food. Mm -hmm. But of course, what I understand from what you're saying is we need to do it differently. That's correct. But And we also need to recognize that without biodiversity, there will be no food. Because it is, it is soil <laughs> microorganisms that um, create the conditions for the plants to access uh, the nutrients in the soil. Uh, it is, uh, in many cases, natural pest control that allows uh, a good production of the crop. So farmers also have an interest in protecting the nature that supports the growth of crops and animals. It's just uh, they face also economic pressures and uh, we are used to replacing nature by mineral and chemical substances, whatever we do, whether it is mm -hmm. for building houses or for farming or for creating bags. You know, we use too much plastic for uh, <laughs> our shopping. True, yeah. We could use um, uh, bags, et cetera, also yeah. for our shopping. It's true that there are many things mm -hmm. that... Uh, There's also a lot of examples of where you've had areas where they've worked with nature to produce food. Um, I remember uh, a while ago I was in, in Florence having a pizza and they the company had a they were branding where the products came from. They're all organic and one of the tomatoes, which made an amazing tomato paste on it, came from a protected area in Brindisi in Puglia in the southeast of Italy. And that's a area where they the park managers worked with the local farmers to protect the environment and also to um, give them a higher yield for their products. So they, they branded it with the slow food movement as well. In my country, in Ireland, there's one area where they, they call it Burn in the west of Ireland, where they do a lot of um, agro-tourism and they work with the landscape and they, they call the local people there, the farmers, the guardians of nature. 
Mm -hmm. um, so they, they you know, really say, well, when you work with nature, you get positive actions. When you work against nature, there is only going to be one winner eventually. Um, there might be a short-term victor, but yeah. long-term, we know we're not yeah, going to succeed. Yeah. Okay, we have another question. So it kind of links to some of the international um, issues that we dealt with. It's from uh, Nicola Bala. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, the last landmark United Nations assessment on biodiversity suggests moving the world away from the limited paradigm of economic growth, we need to reduce and eliminate harmful subsidies said Watson, who, yeah, it's the IQ Best International mm -hmm. Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystems. What role will the EA play in terms of policy advocacy to reflect this guideline? Well, um, I would like to take that question up. Please do. Um, yeah. We, we uh, by our regulation, by our purpose, are meant to provide information on the environment that is as solid and credible as possible. Uh, and uh, we, we don't directly uh, take a position on policy decisions. It's not our role to be an activist. Our role is to be a, a neutral scientist as far as possible. Yeah, but I think even informing of mm. these current trends or threats on nature or other aspects of the environment, because this is only one of the uh, aspects that we work on, we are providing this kind of policy support, allowing others to further define yeah. um, what could be... Trying to get people to make informed decisions. And as Jan Eric said, at the agency we collect a huge amount of environmental data across a variety of different areas. But in the biodiversity world, we, we have some of the largest collections of biodiversity data. And we use that to really help inform EU biodiversity. What do we collect? Maybe we could be a little bit more explicit. So we, we collect information on different types of protected areas the geography of them and in some cases what occurs within those uh, protected areas and what so the, the animals living the in animals, those areas the animals, the, 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 yeah. the landscapes, what the habitats um, the threats and pressures within them uh, we also collect every six years we collect a lot of information on the condition of regions and we collect information on what the trend of it over time is short term, long term, threats, pressures, the population of species, how many bears there are, how many wolves there are, how many butterflies there are, and we collect that and we've done that for uh, three different six year cycles now, So, and we're, we're using that to kind of add it all together like a big jigsaw to tell us what's happening. And we produce a series of reports which are then submitted to the European Parliament and the European Commission and that really helps directly inform mm -hmm. the policies they make. So it's about making people informed and all of this information is available to everyone. Yeah, so. uh, maybe actually to link uh, to this last question, uh, because you did mention that EU is one of the uh, uh, geographical uh, political entities leading some of these global discussions, and uh, IT targets actually are uh, putting some global, uh, I would say, direction to the efforts. And uh, we were talking uh, earlier about how the EU was doing compared to some of these targets. How are we doing? I think that's a, so there was 20 of these targets created ten, nearly 10 years ago in Japan. And a few months later, at the European level, we created six targets ourselves. So of the 20 targets, it's globally accepted that we're not doing particularly well for a lot of them, really. Um, there's one of them on protected area coverage that we're doing, we're doing quite well in one component of it at a European level. We have about 25% of the European Union is covered by, on land, is covered by a protected area of some form, and about 10, just over 10% in the marine. Um, the question is, what is being done in those ones, and how can we ensure that that area, so that 10% in the marine is equivalent to the size of France being protected mm -hmm. in the marine environment. Is that enough? It's so we know if it is not. Well, no, there's a lot of science that says it probably needs to be higher. But what we're trying to do at a European level is collect that information to help make informed decisions about that. Um, make sure they're what's called connected so that the species, particularly in the marine, they move around. Land is the same as well. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing is, at a, Europe, at a global level, we have some of the best information about how we're progressing in this. Um, we may not be collecting all the information we need, um, but at least we can have a pretty clear position as to how we've progressed over time in this and some of it's positive some of it's negative it's good to know yeah i guess 
So maybe we take a few minutes to talk a little bit about the report that we launched um, today. What does it say? Well, Can we summarize the main uh, points that we raise in the report? Well, the report says that we need to understand what's happening to our ecosystems, so we need to be able to measure it in quantitative terms so we can produce the evidence for policy making. Uh, that's the key role of the EA to help take the best decisions to manage the environment better. A and accounting, as I said, um, takes a very structured approach uh, that provides a, a clear overview what's happening to ecosystems and their condition, what is the flow of services in terms of flood regulation, in terms of climate regulation that we get from nature. And uh, we provide uh, evidence where ecosystems are changing and where conditions are stable or deteriorating. And what the report also does, it uh, reviews um, what kind of data foundation we have for measuring what's happening to our ecosystems. And it makes the point that we need to invest in data as a resource, uh, that we need to produce the right information for good policy making. Uh, and we need in Europe to do even more than we do to have the data to manage ecosystems well. So f what I understand is that we already know enough for the indications, but we need more to be able to come up with more effective policies maybe, because I also imagine that there's a big difference between, for example, mountains and uh, a low-lying coastal area. Yes, I think what matters is really whether we have data at national level that give us an indication, is it getting better or worse? Mm -hmm. uh, or whether we have data that we can relate, relate to a specific lake or to a specific river. Mm -hmm. uh, so we know um, where we need to take action. If we know uh, we have problems in a certain river bas basin, we can look at what kind of farming is happening. And so we know what we need to change in terms of agriculture policy uh, to improve the farming that creates these impacts. It is very much like a jigsaw mm -hmm. yeah. puzzle that we were talking about. You know, you actually you need to have all the pieces together. But we are putting, I, my impression is that we are working on putting this uh, I, I think the other thing as well, is the more information we get, we start answering different questions and the, the bigger questions change over time a little bit. So mm -hmm. 10 years ago, some of the questions we were asking were based on the information we could get. And now that has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. So those questions are you know, easy to answer. Now people are asking slightly different ones. Yeah. Could I then just drop two keywords? One is climate change. The other one is satellite information. Where do they come in? Well, climate change yeah. is uh, a major factor in our lives and for all living beings, of course. So also it will so affect ecosystems and ecosystem nature. And nature. And so so we, we expect that we will see uh, significant impacts on nature through increase of forest fire, through lack of water for plant mm -hmm. growth. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we expect that we need to reduce climate change as much as possible and uh, adjust to the changes that already are on the way. Um, satellite information? Yeah. Well, I think because you did yeah. mention that we mm. could use more yeah. data. So with, with satellite information, we're, we're collecting huge amounts of information. So at a European level, they, s um, they send up a series of satellites and they call it Copernicus stuff. So they're Polish Earth astronomer, observation, Earth observation. Yeah. And that transmits 27 terabytes of information which is huge I can't huge <laughs> it's all of everything on netflix practically yeah, yeah. put oh. down every single day to us and we're we have an amazing amount of informa information coming to us and then we're using advances in technology and cloud computing and artificial intelligence to try and work out how we can decipher this huge amount of data coming mm -hmm. to us mm -hmm. so it is really helping us identify changes or in fields over a course of a year, what changes what's happening with land use and so forth. I think even in uh, the measuring moisture yeah. level in soil, we it's can measure just moisture, it's amazing. carbon dioxide, yeah, um, yeah. water, yeah. The, the change in water as well. You can see where the flooding happens or doesn't happen. So in 10 years time, a lot of the information that we're spending a long time collecting will be automatically created by um, 
that last. I, I, okay. I would. It is. It is amazing progress. But uh, I have uh, a slightly <laughs> more skeptical mind than uh, Brian has. Maybe um, my point is that we, still we need to that, that we make in the report. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> we on that. And you also. Uh, that's a point we make in the report that is relevant for getting the most out of satellite data. Is you need to combine different types of data. Mm -hmm. So we need to have also a biodiversity measuring the traditional monitoring of bird species uh, of population trends in nature reserves to be able to then understand what the satellite data tell us and to have a second source of information that can allow us to validate what satellite data tell us. Mm -hmm. uh, satellite really are a massive advantage but we need to not to throw out the old just because we have a new toy. The old was useful and it continues to be useful. I think it's about asking very particular questions and seeing what the different information you can get is and combining, as Jan Eriksson said, sort of not one or the other combination. Yeah. And the other thing about climate change and biodiversity is that climate change leads to biodiversity loss, biodiversity loss leads to climate change. Yeah. So it's this um, cycle that gets worse yeah. and worse and worse towards the afterwards. It's a little bit like this agriculture point and uh, biodiversity. Mm -hmm. We need food, we need to produce food, and it has negative impacts, so you just take care of that. They're both solutions to each other as well. Yeah. And hence, yeah. increased biodiversity leads to decreased climate change, decreased yeah. climate change can lead to increased biodiversity. So can we say that about agriculture as well? Yes, I mean, it's been uh, an area that I've worked on a lot. Um, there is, of course, a lot of uh, habitats and bird species that rely on extensive farming. Uh, that's uh, how European landscapes were created. And there are many farmers that still um, farm in a way that allows uh, species to thrive at the same time. Um, I, I just think we need to see what is the best type of farming in which location mm -hmm. and what are the environment constraints that each farm type needs to respect. And, and some will have an opportunity to produce Biodiversity alongside products, and others might have a, a focus on the ecosystem service of food production, but that still relies on healthy. the soil, the healthy yeah. soils, uh, a, a lot of yeah. nature as well. Yeah, we have one uh, very quick question from Christopher, who says, "Do you have a link to the digital version of the report? We actually published it online this morning. Uh, you can go on our website." Uh, I guess my colleagues could share it in the, um, the comments section with a press release that we have also published. But there's actually quite a bit of additional information in other formats uh, when it comes to like data uh, tools, like indicators and map tools where you can zoom in uh, and look into uh, the protected sites yeah. that you were mentioning. So uh, uh, for the agency, we, we really try to make sure that all the information we collect that goes behind the report that Jan Eric said is, makes, is made available. So we have um, what we call a data service. It's a place where all our information is. We have these map viewers where you can go in and zoom into your, your back garden. You can zoom into your local area. You can figure out where your nearest protected area is. Uh, you might be able to figure out what's in there, what animals, what habitats are there. Um, but we, we make sure everything is available yeah. um, so, so that we're not hiding information. No, everybody is welcome to go and take yeah. a look. The only issue is sometimes there's some very s particular species are very sensitive because they're very rare or very threatened. And countries ask us not to share that, but that is practically the only reason why we wouldn't give the information. Okay. Um, we have another question from Soko Vezani. What is the trend of fragmentation and loss of habitats because of urbanization and infrastructure? So we did talk about agriculture, but this is one of the other uh, drivers. It, it continues to be negative. Uh, that is really the biggest change in our landscapes, uh, that we continue to build housing, uh, hotels, golf courses, and roads together. Uh, so we have a negative trend uh, that is significant. So when we talk about fragmentation, just to go back, we are actually talking about slicing yeah, the landscape into yeah. smaller patches. Yeah. So if, if you're an animal and you're used to moving like from here to here, if you put a blockage in there, you, you can't do that. So this one area becomes two, three, four, five. 
But there is an area we work on the agency called green infrastructure. Which is kind what of is that? It's about mm -hmm. trying to see how you can use the environment to connect the areas. Also, if you are going to do these um, buildings, um, what can you do to minimise the environmental impact? There's examples, some of, the re some of the audience might see it when they're driving along roads. There's often bridges or tunnels underneath it which have wildlife to go across. Mm -hmm. I know in the Netherlands there's several of these where it's about and putting building a bridge between two areas and so it becomes connected again. Um, mm -hmm. So it's really trying to understand how we can work with nature as opposed to against it and where we need to do certain things, how can we minimise the impact of that. Um, but it's an area that we're, we're developing, we're, we're publishing on, we have a series of reports that we've worked with different actors in Europe on to make people aware of what's happening. So can we say that there's awareness around this issue, at least at the policy level, so if these bridges or tunnels have been uh, Jan Erik is still looking a bit... Uh, of course there is awareness, but I mean we are aware that we should smoke less if we are smoker. We are aware we shouldn't <laughs> eat the wrong things. We but still it, do it. In <laughs> some ways I think it's still, I, I think yeah. it is good that, you know, there is a way of addressing some of these issues, maybe partially, but uh, it is possible. So it's what, what is good is that we have very clear data about it, also with the help of the satellites, and we can show very clearly what mm -hmm. the impact is. Uh, there are policy targets to reduce uh, urbanization and fragmentation for decades. It's just there's big economic and other in interests behind building roads, etc., uh, that it's difficult to change course. I mean, we need yeah. to become a more sustainable society in general, and it's it's quite a bit of work. It takes time, I guess. I, I think just building on that, I mean, yeah. we've known for the last number of years what the situation is in terms of the environment. Um, it's just, I think, how important that is in terms of people and elected officials and so forth has varied. And sometimes decisions have been made when it's been quite clear that there's it's very against the na nature to do so and it's about how do you prioritize the environment over different issues maybe uh we just take a few points on um are there any success stories maybe just very quickly like has have we been able to reverse the trend where we see you know some species flourishing again I yes one mm -hmm. that comes to my mind is the iberian lynx in portugal and spain which was nearly functionally extinct, it was practically extinct brink of several years, and the very brink of extinction a few years ago, and through a lot of concerted effort by the Portuguese government, the Spanish government, the local governments, and the European Union, that the trend has increased, and I think I saw somewhere on, on Twitter or Facebook that last week for the first time in 100 years was a link spotted in Portugal in the wild. Mm -hmm. um, so th there are success stories, there's a lot of negative stories, but there's a lot of stories where we can see those increases. Um, one of these life projects I mentioned earlier on was about having the rope going between um, France, Italy and Slovenia. And how do you do that while minimising any potential negative impact of it, you know, with farmers and so forth. But there's a lot of work being done to try and improve what's happening. There's some species which would be completely extinct in Europe if we hadn't acted on them. Mm -hmm. um, and we're, we're trying to see how we can promote those and highlight those success stories. And maybe another point, if um, I may ask, uh, me as an individual, what can I do? Very briefly, you know, can I make a difference? I'm sure you can. I mean, without uh, different lifestyles, um, we will not be able to achieve the transition that we aim for. Um, you can, of course, buy, for example, organic food, uh, because that's a more environmentally friendly, more biodiversity friendly type of farming. You can join an NGO. Uh, they are an advocacy group for uh, wildlife. Uh, so directly, indirectly, you, you can make many contributions. Um, we continue here to work on the information system. I think we are getting better at it, but the challenge for society is, is to act on the information. Uh, and uh, as, as I said, in our personal life, that's a challenge. That's a, a challenge for European society. The more information we have, the, the better we hopefully get at yeah. making the right choices. Yeah. I guess with international days like today, the awareness level is hopefully increasing a little bit, and then I maybe those choices. I mean, could that's be the made. idea. Is, I mean, you can do a lot yourself. I mean, ask questions about where your food is coming from, where the 
your drink is coming from, your clothes as well. Um, as Jan Eric said, we do need to change our lifestyles a certain amount. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the disposable idea of like just getting something and throwing it away. But then when politics happens as well, ask questions about your elected officials and say, well, yeah. what are you I'm doing about I'm it? I'm still optimistic. I do see some, yeah. at least on the climate change we, point. We, we, uh, can, we, can uh, do, we can do a certain amount with our own actions. And then you're trying to influence wider public and influence big companies, influence governments to change what they're doing. Yeah. And then yeah. it can happen. Any last thoughts? Anything you'd like to add, add before we wrap up, or should we? No, I think. I, I just I think what personally what, what my my passion about is trying to collect information and communicate it out to people so that everyone is aware of what's happening. And the European Commissioner last week at the, the Green Week, yet another week of highlighting the environment, highlighted the importance of. I think he said, "Listen to nature," and then he had um, he had a quote about. Um, you know, we need to make information available in a clear way, make it transparent and essential, and you know, make sure that everyone has the same information at the same level, and that they can access it, and, and not that it's just available for the expert. Yeah. But how can we make the information available for the expert, but also tell the general public what's happening as so well? So, with those words, I just wrap up saying we do have massive amounts of information on on our website. Um, actually. Uh, some of it is in 25 languages, so please uh, go and visit and check um, what we have. And um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.